This is the Orbis Etherum, an alternate dimension. Within the great pool of ether that comprises the Orbis are portals to worlds, pocket realms where life thrives, and where human beings live. Present throughout its entirety is the energy called ether, so tied into life here that all living things are sustained by it. This includes the Orbis' humans, who breathe ether as we do air. Among these people are the Ethermancers, gifted with amazing abilities beyond even their ether sustained brethren. An Ethermancer may possess enhanced strength and speed, amazing cognition, mental powers, even the ability to shapeshift. Ethermancy manifests in varied and awesome ways. Where the Orbis Etherum is very much like our universe is in human ambition and the ingenuity and suffering that follow it. An alternate dimension so different from ours, yet its people still live storied lives fraught with untold joy, deep sorrow, and amazing adventure. I'm Carlos, your storyteller. I will take you across the Orbis's history, delving into multiple tales. Consecutive episodes will not necessarily follow one tale to its ultimate conclusion. Sometimes we'll pick up where we left off, sometimes we'll journey somewhere new. And sometimes we'll go back to where we once were, where we must return. Due to the serialized nature of these stories, you may want to go back and listen from the beginning, or you can start here and piece everything together as you go. It's your call. Without further ado, I present to you Tales from the Orbis Etherum. The Reluctant Adventures of Lucia Wolf, Part 4 Cavernous Hate Year 697 OAY, 20 years ago. Rosa and Raul Carvalho, teenage siblings, toil in the depths of the Lucent Caverns. They're slaves, prisoners of a cruel, independent Etheramite mining team, one hired to go where properly compensated workers dare not tread. Rosa checks on her brother, then returns to work before their overseer can punish her for the gesture. She doesn't question why they're here, why these depths are avoided, something about gem golems she overheard earlier. All Rosa cares about is ensuring that she and her brother survive this ordeal, as they intend to return some day to a normal life. She feels the cutting tool, a precision instrument that channels the energy of an ether battery into a specially designed, vibrating blade. Using it to free a chunk of etheramite from a stubborn wall, Rosa imagines she's using this precision instrument to carve into their slavers. Raoul's coughing brings her back to reality, and she runs to him. The Overseer, a cruel mountain of a man, orders her back to work, but she won't obey. Raoul is everything to her. The Overseer grabs her hair and she screams. The Overseer, that formidable, intimidating mountain of a man, made a fatal mistake. He didn't see that Rosa still held the cutting tool, the precision instrument. The next few minutes are gruesome, a crazed Rosa stabbing and cutting at the long-dead mountain of a man, a former overseer turned corpse, blood spraying about the cave. She stops, tears streaming down her face as Raoul holds her from behind, Rosa leaning back into his warmth as they both wail. They don't know why more overseers aren't coming to punish them. They don't know the cave they're in is on the verge of collapse, the other reason why properly compensated workers avoided it. All they know, all they care about right now, this moment, is each other. The cave collapses, brother and sister's hands clasped, content to die together in these lonely, lonely depths. At the very least, they'd have each other. The sound, like a heartbeat. Was it her brother's? Rosa can barely see out of her only good eye. Pinned to the ground, immeasurable volume of rock and stone crushing them, she sees Raoul's lifeless body. Precious, precious Raoul had passed. And soon, 
so would she. They'd have each other again. The heartbeat grows louder, and soon a voice, one that permeates Rose's very core, seeming to come from everywhere, rattling her very being. Rosa strains, struggling to make out the words. And there are words, though they're tough to make out in what sounds like a thousand voices all speaking in unison, some promising power, others shouting warnings. Rosa focuses, shutting her eyes and listening intently. Then her eyes open wide and she sees the tip of it. A gem, some precious stone, but different. Glowing violet, radiating power, and something else. Something fearful. Something awful. Something utterly true. Something primal. Rosa reaches out to it, stretching her arm, then a finger, groaning as her broken body begs her to stop. She reaches and touches the tip of the gem. And when she does, raw power erupts, and she is Rosa Carvalho no more. Year 717 OAY Present Day In two separate caves, two separate battles are waged. In one, a melee. The vicious swordswoman, Lucia Wolf fights Soul Cabinet Martial Artist Shone as a frightened Elaine Shadowbane watches from behind cover. In another, a flurry of ranged attacks. Conjurer Rhea Wilhelm battles Shone's brother Reflector, Rhea sending spells Reflector's way as the boy returns fire with ether pistols. You're good, Shone compliments, dodging a lethal slash and responding with a kick, knocking Lucia back. You move more fluidly than a brute ought to. Lucia recovers. You're not bad yourself, little girl. You an adult yet? I think I want to ask you out, but I don't want to be creepy, you know? Shone smirks, then... gambles. You sure your conjurer friend would approve? Seems like she's got you on a short leash. We're not a couple, Rhea shouts. Not that it's any of your business. Reflector dodges a blast of fire with ease. You're easy to read, Miss Wilhelm. In more ways than one. Rhea prepares another spell, then notices something in her periphery. A ripple in the air on either side of her. Let me show you, the boy says, why they call me Reflector. He fires shots at each ripple, Actually, ether wall, specially designed by Reflector, to reflect his projectiles. And reflect they do, directly at Rhea. She readies a barrier as several shots converge, exploding around her. Disappointing, Lucia spits, parrying and dodging Shone's kicks and responding with a kick of her own, followed by a slash so fast Shona can't quite get out of the way in time. It takes a bit of her hair off. And another slash that Shone attempts to deflect with an ether-infused fist. While the slash doesn't pierce Shone's shielded hand, she can't quite redirect the force and is sent flying back, crashing into a wall. Can't beat me, Lucia says, hungry for the kill. So you try getting into my head. Pretty sad, little girl. Shone, on one knee, spits up blood, looking up at the vicious swordswoman. Lucia approaches at a methodical pace, licking her lips. Another successful hunt. I don't like weaklings, Lucia snarls. Shone grits her teeth, then chuckles. Then the chuckle turns into an outright laugh. <laughs> You don't like weaklings? Then what are you doing protecting her? The deposed young queen peeks from behind her cover. Elaine Shadowbane is as weak as they come, Shone says. She's no Ethermancer. Hell, she's no queen. She couldn't protect her throne 
or her family. Rhea's on the ground, on her stomach, struggling to move, a task that proves difficult with Reflector's knee on her back, and a task she outright abandons when she feels the tip of Reflector's pistol at the back of her head. The Orbis Scholars are either immensely stupid, Reflector says, or immensely spiteful. Did you do anything to earn their ire? Rhea says nothing. Or perhaps, did they know you'd bring in your friend Lucia? Still stupid, but a little more understandable. Tears well up in Rhea's eyes. Reflector notices. A terrible feeling, isn't it? He says. Weakness. Failure. But it doesn't have to be this way, Miss Wilhelm. Rhea tries desperately to stop crying, but can't. How'd you like to be as strong as your friend? Reflector asks. Better yet, how'd you like to be stronger? Shone keeps talking, as her words are clearly giving the vicious swordswoman pause. Shone hopes Lucia fails to notice the gathering ether, Shone's trump card for these rare situations where her back is to a wall. Is it worth it, Lucia Wolf? Shon taunts. Is it worth giving up your comfortable life for a weak girl you barely know, and for a woman you'll never be with? Shon laughs again. <laughs> oh, we know all about you and Wilhelm. We had you pegged as her hired help the moment she decided, so foolishly, to help Shadowbane. We know everything about you including the exact location of that precarious hovel you call a home. At that, Lucia charges, ready to bring her a theramite blade down on Shone's skull. And that gives Shone the opening she was fishing for. Lucia reacts just barely in time, kicking off the ground into a sprint back to Elaine. Lucia jumps on top of the deposed young queen, shielding her just as the blast engulfs the cave. The familiar rumble distracts Reflector as he wonders if his sister is all right. And that gives Rhea the opening she was praying for. She flips, knocking Reflector and his pistol away, then focuses all of her ether into an orb of electricity. Rhea sends the lightning ball at Reflector with enough force to knock her back. Reflector is... amused. Cute, he says putting up his reflective ether walls, dissipating much of the attack. Once the last crackle of conjured electricity sputters out of existence, Rhea is gone. The dust settles, and Lucia, breathing heavily, bruised and bleeding all over, falls off of the lane. The deposed young queen, for her part, is barely hurt. Why am I fighting for you, anyway? Lucia mouths, slowly picking herself up. Elaine's face tightens, the girl about to cry. Lucia ignores the sniffling, looking around for the upstart teenage martial artist who nearly got them all killed. Gone, Lucia observes. Too bad, I really wanted to kill her. Elaine is full-on crying, and it doesn't look like she's going to stop soon. Quit your sniveling, Highness. Get up. Elaine doesn't, instead burying her face in her hands, sobbing. Lucia sighs heavily, then kneels. <sighs> Look, I'm, I'm sorry, okay? I, I, I was slightly pissed off at nearly dying like five times tonight. I didn't mean it. I, I'm sorry. Come on, come on, look at me. Elaine shakes her head, hands still covering her face. Okay, you know what? Fine. Stay mad, Lucia says, picking Elaine up. But we have to go. Lucia, carrying the crying Elaine, leaves the scene, hoping they weren't all hopelessly lost in the loosened cavern's depths. Rhea keeps running, knowing Reflector is on her tail. She can't beat him, and she knows it. 
How'd you like to be as strong as your friend? Reflector's question echoes in her mind. Better yet, how'd you like to be stronger? Rhea shoves the thought aside, filing it away, focusing on eluding Reflector somehow. She doesn't dwell on that too long, though, as suddenly a wall springs up from the ground behind her, closing off the path. What the? Rhea wonders, and then is cut off when a hole opens beneath her. She falls to a lower level, not quite able to cushion herself in ether before landing hard. Swearing, she picks herself up, and finds herself, face to face, with no less than a half dozen gem golems. And riding atop one of the golems is a woman. A girl, really. A girl of frail frame, but glowing, an ether coursing within her that Rhea has yet to comprehend. Hi there, the girl says. I'm Anemone, pleased to meet you. So, so listen, I'm, I'm here to kill you. But, but that doesn't mean we can't be friends, right? That's it for this episode. If you like what you've heard, and even if you didn't, drop me a line on my website, orbisetherum.com. That's O-R-B-I-S-A-E-T-H-E-R-U-M dot com. Thank you for listening. Until next time.